Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation, and chronic daily migraine survivor. I'm happy to say that I am here today with Dr. Tim Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you? Hey, Lindsay. I'm fine. How are you? Good. Uh, we are here today with Dr. Smith, and many people know that when we have Dr. Smith on, we're talking about something important related to medications, as he is the CEO of Study Metrics Research, and he has done multiple clinical trials related to migraine. He also happens to be the vice president of the National Headache Foundation. So today, we are talking about some interesting data that has come to light related to Botox and women who are pregnant. There is a registry um, for Botox, and it uh, includes data for exposure to Botox in women who are pregnant. Now, we want to make it clear that Botox has not been cleared by the FDA for use in pregnancy, but whenever there is an accidental exposure or perhaps an exposure where the doctor felt it was appropriate for the woman to use Botox during pregnancy, um, usually she's recorded in a registry specific to Botox, and that data goes into a place where it can be observed and studied later. And they have reported on this data, and we wanted everyone to be aware of it as Botox is so important to the migraine community. And so many of us use it for chronic migraine, and then we have to stop when we become pregnant. So let's start. Dr. Smith, can you tell us what the safety classification of Botox is? Yes, it's technically it's what they call uh, pregnancy category C. Mm -hmm. uh, the FDA is officially moving away from their categorization, but uh, Botox has been categorized as, as uh, uh, category C. And what does that mean for a pregnant woman? Yeah, so category C is kind of like the middle. It's the most commonly um, reported. Right. Category A means that they have good data uh, showing that there's no risk and there are no drugs that fit that category because we don't do control studies on pregnant women. Mm -hmm. um, category B means they've got uh, no animal evidence that there's a problem and they've got extensive clinical use uh, in, in the, and there appear to be no problems. Mm -hmm. And category C means either it hasn't been studied or there are some uh, data showing that there are animal uh, problems in animal studies, but the, the jury's still out on human, um, you know, uh, uh, pregnancy complications. D is where there's an obvious uh, potential risk, and then the last one was category X, they used to call it, which meant it was strictly contraindicated and should be avoided at all cost in pregnancy. But so Botox falls into the category C according to that labeling structure. Okay. Um, so in this registry, uh, how many pregnant wo women who were exposed to Botox were studied and then reported on? So in this registry, there are a total of 910 uh, pregnancies that have been uh, cataloged and, and followed in the registry. They only had uh, uh, th almost 400, 397, I believe is the actual number, that had uh, clear-cut outcomes so they could know exactly what happened to the the pregnancy uh, was the baby okay were there any delivery complications and that sort of thing the rest were either lost to follow-up or they had incomplete data and uh, wasn't uh, felt to be scientifically accurate to report out on okay so what kind of outcomes did they follow these women and their babies for so for this for this population they uh, they reported uh, number or percentage of uh, outcomes was 2.6 percent that had abnormalities and uh, only 0.9 percent of uh, major uh, defects as they uh, categorize that and um, just to compare that to background and as you know this we don't have um, like a comparison group in the registry you don't have you know uh, pregnancies without exposure register you know logging into the registry for right. a direct head-to-head -head comparison which would be the best science but what the next second best science is to compare it to background information in the general population mm -hmm. and we know that reported literature says that the general population um, background incidents of, of um, 
birth defects of major uh, incidents of birth uh, abnormalities is somewhere between three and six percent. So actually the, the, the Botox registry of these reported is a little lower than that. Okay. Uh, so it's not exactly comparing apples to apples, but it is uh, uh, on the reassuring side to know that. So was there a statistically significant difference between the women exposed to Botox and other women? Yeah, so since it's not a, um, uh, since it's not a matched population, um, statistics can't be done on it. So we just have to do what we call a descriptive analysis. That means you put them side by side and, and you know, take away from it what you, what you can. And so for major defects, 0.9% in the, in the Botox registry, uh, 3% or more uh, for the background population as a whole. Okay. Um, so were there, I believe they also followed the women for um, issues in delivery or complications of pregnancy itself, uh, in addition to birth defects. Were there any differences uh, in the Botox group there? Well, the, the, uh, the total, when you look at all abnormalities, that includes uh, birth problems okay. or uh, premature labor, uh, some other kind of birth abnormality, and that goes into the 2.6% number okay. for, the, for the total. The 0.9 is just major abnormalities. Uh, minor abnormalities would be just cosmetic things that don't require any, any issues, things that might go away with time or don't, don't present a risk of health. Major abnormalities are those that might recur, require a surgical intervention, for exam, example, okay. like a heart abnormality or something like that would be considered a major abnormality. So when you lump them all together, the number's still pretty small. Okay, all right. Um, so we need to be careful interpreting these data because Botox is still not indicated by the FDA for women who are pregnant, is that correct? That's correct, and even though you know, these numbers are uh, reassuring on the surface, we do know that some animal studies showed that there can be a risk of low birth weight, and early, uh, labor, those kinds of things. And in some species of animal studies, there were some uh, fetal demise cases or, or even maternal demise cases. Now, and to be fair, in those animal studies, they used really high doses and studied them in different ways. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, they didn't uh, pass through that testing with a, with a complete, you know, uh, uh, clean slate. Uh, so that's something we always would be concerned about. That said, you know, it is reassuring to know and, and that uh, at least in this study, and, and again, background information is obtained in one way uh, and the registry is, is basically, it's the flaw in the data is that signing up for the registry is an elective thing. It's something mm -hmm. that people voluntarily do. Um, you know, physicians can turn in um, a defect or, or a pregnancy rather, uh, but uh, patients can also do it. And so it's, it kind of comes from reporting from different sources and uh, you have to be careful how you interpret that. Okay, so what do you think that women with migraine can take away from this new data? Well, I think uh, it's, it's, it's reassuring to the extent that no glaring abnormalities were found. So mm -hmm. what I would you know, advise is you know, try to avoid becoming pregnant while you're on Botox. If you are uh, trying to become pregnant, it's advisable not to start Botox. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have um, been on Botox, you should wait at least three months before trying to become pregnant. And uh, um, some, some scientists and doctors recommend that you do a pregnancy test prior to each dose of Botox. I don't know that that's a widely you know, practiced uh, recommendation. Um, but if you know you become pregnant on Botox, the medical advice is to, to discontinue it until after the pregnancy. Right. However, if you find out you're pregnant on Botox, uh, I wouldn't panic. There's no, you know, the, the, we've got some reassuring data here to let us know that, you know, your baby's probably going to be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and there may be some, um, you know, background noise that, you know, it doesn't go to zero percent. And, and we know that just, you know, because that's the nature of, of what goes on. But uh, those would be my sort of general recommendations for women, in, you know, in, in 
the women who would use Botox generally for migraine, and I forgot to mention in this registry, this is Botox used for any indication. So it wasn't just migraine stuff. Right. It was some um, people who used it for cosmetic reasons too. Or other spasticity or other mm -hmm. pain indications. Um, but, um, you know, so, so that's, um, it's, it's a reassuring thing. And, um, you know, I think we can at least draw a little bit of confidence from that. I wouldn't want anybody to panic if they found out they were uh, pregnant. Um, but, you know, our, our patients that would use Botox for migraine are women in their childbearing years. So this is a, right. a real concern. Okay. All right. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this episode of Heads Up. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And everyone, please join us again next week for the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. Bye-bye.